because God doesn't look on the outward like we do. And I've said often that there are only two opinions on any topic, God's and everyone else's, and everyone else's is wrong when they're in contradiction to God's, without exception. He sees past the outside of the cup and he goes straight to the heart. When someone is found in sin and you find out about it, or someone has a struggle and you find out about it, what are the first words that come out of your mouth? What are the first thoughts that come to your mind? One day, two bums went into a liquor store. They stole a giant bottle of expensive wine. They fled the scene of the crime, and a frightened attendant quickly called the police, who didn't take much time to catch up with the two men walking down the street, enjoying their beverage of choice. As the two men saw the officers approaching, the one man hurriedly handed the brown bag to his partner next to him, and before the second guy could find a bush for the bag, the officers confronted him and said, hey, two men fitting your exact descriptions were just reported to have stolen a bottle of expensive wine from the store just a block away. Of course, the first bum denied any wrongdoing, and the second bum followed suit. And so the officer asked him, uh, well, what's in that brown bag? The man said, in, in my brown bag here? Well, that's just water. The officer said, water? What do you mean that's just a bottle of water? The bum said, yeah, right here in my bag, this is just a bottle of water. So the officer said, well, if that's just a bottle of water, why don't you just go ahead and show it to me? So the man slowly and cautiously started to <laughs> unfold his little brown bag. And as he peered into it and began to pull the bottle out of the bag, he exclaimed to the officer, oh my word, you are not going to believe it. He's still turning water into wine. <laughs> I have no idea what that has to do with my sermon. <laughs> Truly getting caught red-handed in the very act of anything illegal or immoral is something that most of us try to avoid at all costs. But that's exactly how the story that I want to look at today starts out. In fact, the title of this message is Caught in the Act. Uh, this will be part one of a two-part message. I'd like to invite you to turn with me, if you will, to the fourth book in the New Testament, the book of John and chapter 8. John chapter 8. It's here that we find the record of an event in Jesus' earthly ministry that's found nowhere else in the other Gospels. None of the synoptic Gospels, which are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, include an account of this story. However, as you read this story, you recognize that it's a bit of synoptic-like material stuck in the middle of John's gospel. It's a story where Jesus has a very public confrontation, but he speaks only a total of four sentences in this story. A good lesson for all of us to be sure. And that's why James 1 and 19 says, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen and slow to speak. So I guess that's why we have two ears and one mouth by design and for good reason. Now the story begins with the assembly, because looking back in John chapter 7 and verse 2, it says, now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. And then in John chapter 7 and verse 37, it says, on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. What a beautiful passage of Scripture. But according to the book of Numbers chapter 29 and Deuteronomy chapter 16, the Feast of Tabernacles was to last seven days. However, in Numbers 29 and verse 35, it states that the eighth day was also celebrated as a solemn assembly where no work was to be done. It says in Numbers 29 and verse 35, on the eighth day you shall have a sacred assembly. You shall do no customary work. And so when Jesus cried out that incredible invitation, it was on the last day or the seventh day or the great day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And chapter 7 ends with everyone going home to their own house after an amazing, truly historic day at the temple. And then in John chapter 8 and verse 1, we're told that Jesus woke up early and he returned to the temple to teach on the morning of the added eighth day 
of the feast, which it's important to mention again, was to be a day of rest. And so beginning in John 8 and verse 1, we read, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Now early in the morning He came again into the temple, and all the people came to Him. And He sat down and taught them. Now as with all biblical stories, it's always helpful to set the stage for where this event is taking place. And many people are very familiar with this story, but they're not familiar with where it actually takes place. Because this whole confrontation goes down, not on a grassy knoll out in the wilderness, but rather smack dab in the middle of the temple, right in the middle of the local assembly. In other words, this all went down at church. This story takes place in God's house. Because it tells us that Jesus got up early that day, and he went to church. And when he showed up, it says not just some, but all of the people came to Jesus to hear him teach and preach. Because when Jesus walked in, everyone stopped talking and everyone started listening. Because when God shows up in his house, it doesn't matter who else is in the house. It doesn't matter what Pharisee seminary that you're president of. It doesn't matter how many letters follow your name. It doesn't matter how many guys with turbans are walking behind you taking notes. No, it doesn't matter who or what you are or who or what you think you are. When God shows up in his house, we hand him our microphone because there's nothing quite like the living word expositing the written word. And so naturally, Jesus was teaching and preaching. But as he was speaking, he was interrupted by a disturbance in the force in the middle of his sermon. Because verse 3 tells us that the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in the very act of adultery. Think of that. They caught her in the very act of adultery. And it says that they set her in the midst. That's a neat and tidy way of saying that a bunch of spiritual leaders, and a bunch of religious folks, dragged a woman into the middle of a church service where Jesus Christ was the guest speaker of choice. They plopped her right down, smack dab in the middle of the congregation. It would be like someone coming in right now and putting a woman in the middle of this aisle as I'm teaching today. Because we saw that it says all the people gathered around and sat down to hear Jesus teach. And so the narrative quickly transitions from the assembly to adultery. This church service was taking a bunch of wrong turns, and they were all for the worse. Because as Jesus is opening the Scriptures and speaking about a new commandment of loving one another and talking about good news for poor people and healing for broken-hearted beggars and freedom for captives and recovery of sight for blind folks and liberty for oppressed people and rivers of living water for thirsty people, As Jesus was talking all about that, the most prominent pastors in the area came barging and bustling in and brought Jesus' sermon to a total standstill. Maybe better stated, they turned Jesus' sermon into a standoff. Because it's here that we begin to see two different perspectives and sons of different fathers coming together in a head-on collision and confrontation. And their perspectives revealed their hearts, which is always the case. Because more often than not, listen to me, my perspective of you is actually a revelation of me. Don't miss that. My perspective of each of you is almost always a revelation of me and not of you. Which at times we all have to admit incriminates every single person, including me, sitting in the sanctuary this morning. Because Pharisee perspective number one was this. Expose people to cover my own sin. Versus Jesus' perspective, which was expose sin to pardon people. Because Jesus came preaching a message of peace. But these Pharisees wanted war. Jesus came preaching a message of forgiveness, but they wanted blood. And so it says in verse 3, then, meaning after Jesus had come into the temple and started to teach all of the people, it was then 
that the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Now we're told very little about this offender of the law. In fact, we're not even told her name. All she is called five times in this story is woman. Woman. But even though we're never told her name, we assuredly are told her sin. In fact, everyone was told her sin. And this woman experienced everyone's worst nightmare because she was caught in the very act of adultery with nowhere to go and no one to turn to everyone's worst nightmare. A church news bulletin, and the topic is all about you. Specifically, something extremely embarrassing about you, something shameful and sinful about you. Hey, I have an idea. Let's all gather around and talk about your guilt. Let's have a roundtable discussion about your shame. A board meeting with the topic of debate focused solely on your sin. Truly, everyone's worst nightmare for this lady known by no other name than woman. Because Pharisees expose others to justify themselves. And they love to uncover the sin of others so that they can cover their own, the perspective of a Pharisee. Now, I believe it's a reasonable assumption that this woman hadn't literally just been caught in the act of adultery as it was early morning. It's much more likely that she'd been caught in the act during the night and then had been held waiting for Jesus, as the text says, so that they could test him. She was the bait. Because the previous chapter, John chapter 7, ends with a clear description of the Pharisees' seething desire to entrap and ensnare Jesus and to apprehend him. And so this morning, I encourage you to, just for a second, put yourself in her shoes. She's caught by a whole board of pathetic pastors while she's committing the very act of adultery. And then she's hauled out and she's held over to be used as bait to try to test the most famous traveling preacher and teacher of the day. This is the man who had cried out a prophetic message during the most solemn feast day of the year just the day before, and because of who he was, he actually got away with it. Surely this woman was filled with fear and racked with regret and sinking in sorrow, dreading the dawning of the day. But then to make matters even worse, they didn't take her discreetly and quietly to Jesus while he was alone. They did the opposite of Galatians 6 and 1, which tells us, brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, this is a key, you know someone spiritual, if they restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, listen, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. But all spirituality and gentleness and humility were entirely absent from their handling of this sinful woman. And it was a revelation not of her heart, no, it was a revelation of their hearts. Because when you judge someone this way, it doesn't define who they are, it defines who you are. So they drag her into the temple intent on creating a very public spectacle. They pull her into the church house and they put her down in the midst or the middle of the whole assembly of people gathering around to listen to Jesus teach and preach. One translation says they made her stand before the group. Another says they put her in front of the crowd. Think about that. Talk about shame. Talk about guilt. Talk about fear. Talk about public humiliation. I don't think it could be much worse of a scenario for a sinner, especially one that was caught in the very act of adultery. But what she didn't know then, but was about to find out, is that when you start your day in a bed of sin, there's no better place to end your day than at the feet of the Savior. And she woke up in a bed of iniquity, but she was going to end up at a seat of mercy. Because this wayward gal was about to get a Sunday school lesson straight from Jesus that took her from a life of adultery to a lesson in atonement. Because Jesus Christ came and interrupted history to become a Savior and to make it forever his story. And his clarion call was one crying out for thirsty people to come to living waters. 
as Jesus Christ came saying, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Yes, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. And the great physician came to this world seeking sick folks. The all-sufficient one came seeking needy folks. The hope of humanity came seeking out desperate folks. And the light of the world came seeking to dispel darkness with His great light. He came intent on defeating death with resurrection life. Who can say amen today? There was no doubt in heaven's itinerary that when Jesus Christ came, He was intent on seeking and saving that which was lost For Jesus Christ, the Savior of the whole world, came crying out and calling sinners like you and me to repentance. And the same is true today. Because whether you're a sorry sinner or a sinning saint, there's no better place to end our day than at the feet of Jesus Christ, the Savior of this whole world. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Reading from the Amplified Bible in verse 3, it says, They made her stand in the center of of the court. And they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. And so what started out as an assembly with all ears listening to Jesus turned into a courtroom with all eyes centered on an adulterer. And the temple metamorphosed into a courtroom with serious accusations ringing out from accusers. Because Pharisees expose other people, but they cover their own sin. Look at verse 5. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. So they're accusing her, and now they're looking for something with which they can accuse Jesus Christ. Which brings us to Pharisee perspective number two, which is principles over people and law over love. Versus Jesus' perspective, which is principles are created for people and love fulfills the law. And that's why in Mark 2 and 27, Jesus said, the Sabbath was made for man and not, listen, man for the Sabbath. Another translation says, The Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. In other words, the principle of the Sabbath was to be a blessing, not a burden. And the purpose of the rule was to bring rest, not just to add another restriction. That's very important because you can't even begin to address this, this turn of events without first making a few comments about these jokers who are trying to test Jesus Christ. Simply stated, I'd say to all of us today, don't do that. (laughs) Whenever we approach the Lord intent on testing Him, we've set ourselves up for failure. Because truly, you can't test the one who wrote the test. Jesus is the one who said, a student is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. Or as I used to tell my son on the basketball court, son, I may have taught you everything you know, but may you never forget that I've not told you everything that I know. It's important to make sure that pupils remember their place. But these teachers of the law made the bad decision to try to give a test of the law to the fulfillment of the law, to which I say two words, bad move. Because Jesus had not yet even acknowledged them, and yet they were already and checkmate. What they didn't know is that their little game was over before it even had started. Because you don't test God. Ever. You will always lose. When you start out walking up to the desk and handing God a test, you're going to end up slinking out of the classroom with a big fat F. You can bank on it because you simply don't test God. And so we've talked about the assembly. And we've talked about the adultery. But now let's talk a little bit about the accusers. Because Pharisee perspective number three is this. False love of laws hides real hatred for the lawgiver. Versus Jesus' perspective, which is real love of people 
applies God's laws according to God's heart. Don't miss that. Because the first unmistakable thing about these characters is that they cloaked their hatred for Jesus in a false display of love for the law. They feigned total love for the law to hide their pure hatred for the lawgiver. For the Bible tells us that there's only one lawgiver and judge, and these Pharisees were standing right in front of him. And just a few short verses later, in John chapter 8 and verse 37, the lawgiver made this statement to each of them. I know that you are Abraham's descendants, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with, listen, your father. See, Jesus has no patience for pretense, and he has no tolerance for treachery. And when he sees it, he calls it out. He, Jesus doesn't play silly mind games when people walk up to him with tests. No, he calls it as he is, and so do his men. And that's why just a few short verses after that statement, he laid it all out for them on the line, because in verse 41, these accusers skipped from the topic of adultery, and they transitioned to the topic of fornication. As John 8 and 41 says, Then they said to him, to Jesus, We were not born of fornication. We have one Father, God. But Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. Did you know that one of the signs that someone is truly born again is that Jesus Christ becomes the single most important thing in the world to them. In fact, they'll give their lives for Jesus Christ. That's how you know that someone is truly born again. If God were your father, you would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? Because you are not able to listen to my word. And then listen to what Jesus told these Pharisees who plunked this lady down in front of him. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Here Jesus Christ calls them out, and he removes all doubt as to what is really motivating these Pharisees. Like little bugs under a dark rock, he lifts up the stone of their secrecy and their deceit, and he shines his bright light into their dark hearts, revealing that they're motivated by a desire to carry out the programs of their father, the devil, who's been a murderer, Jesus said, from the beginning. And that is why when you read through Jesus' life, they constantly are trying to kill him because their father was the devil who was a murderer. And they looked like their dad. They spoke like their dad. They hated like their dad. They connived like their dad. And they had murderous hearts filled with hate, just like their dad, the devil, a murderer from the beginning and a liar and the father of it. For Lucifer is the inventor and peddler of all things that are false. And as Jesus looked at the scene before him, as the judge surveyed his, his courtroom, he saw a large assembly of sheep as those having no shepherd. And he saw this adulteress who was already dead in her trespasses and her sins. And he saw accusers lifted up in pride and filled with hate and murder and lies and deceit. Because it's so important to remember that Jesus Christ, when he looks around, he doesn't see the world around us like we see it. And so often what impresses all of us gags him. Because he's the one that told us, or maybe I should say the one that warned us, that his ways and his thoughts aren't at all like our ways and our thoughts. No, they're higher, they're broader, and they are always, without exception, better. And I've said often that there are only two opinions on any topic, God's, and everyone else's, and everyone else's is wrong when they're in contradiction to God's, without exception. Because God's always the biggest, smartest, and oldest person in the room, and that's why he never sees things like anyone else. Because he judges books by content of character and not covers. And whereas, man, we, we see fancy clothes, God often sees poor and wretched hearts 
Whereas man sometimes sees immodest clothes, Jesus sees longing and insecure hearts. Because God doesn't look on the outward like we do. I can't say it any better than God said it himself in 1 Samuel 16 and 7, saying to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at his physical stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord, he looks at the heart. So God's got x-ray vision and he sees hearts. And he considers and he examines hearts. And he weighs our intents and our motives. And his eyes see the pride in hearts and his eyes see the pain in hearts. His eyes see the deceit in hearts and his eyes see the deception in hearts. He sees the lies in hearts and he sees the longing in our hearts. This morning, God sees our motives. He hears our thoughts. And we could fool everyone around us, but one person we will never fool is the Lord Jesus Christ. Because whether it's fancy or filthy, he sees past the outside of the cup and he goes straight to the heart. For he is the one who told us, hear and understand. Not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth defiles a man. And that's why Proverbs 4 and 23 tells us to guard our heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Because today, right now, God sees you and he sees your heart. And that's why he justifies publicans with simple prayers from lowly hearts. But he judges Pharisees with sophisticated prayers from lofty hearts. Because God doesn't care nearly as much about fancy robes and fancy suits and colorful prayer shawls and designer dresses and beautiful Bibles with gold-tipped pages. No, God, the God who sees and weighs and who considers every single thought and intent and motive doesn't care nearly as much about all of that stuff as he cares about the condition of our heart. And these Pharisees were shiny china, but they were filled with carnal crud. And that's why in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus made this statement, and we need to heed his words in 2024. Beware, beware, Jesus says to us this morning, of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing. Outwardly, in other words, they, they look great, they look wonderful. But inwardly, they are ravenous wolves, and you will know them by their fruits. I'm very thankful for YouTube. I'm thankful that as Jesus' return is coming closer, these ravenous wolves who they feign themselves to be sheep are now being exposed on YouTube. And I'd encourage you to be very careful who you listen to. And then he made this startling statement. Many will say to me, listen to this. This is what Jesus, I'm quoting Jesus word for word. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, Have we not prophesied in your name? That's pretty impressive. Have we not cast out demons in your name and done many, not just a few, but many wonders in your name? Jesus says, and then I will declare to them. This is his response. I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. So you mean to tell me that there will be religious folks in hell? You mean to tell me that there will be preachers in hell? You mean to tell me that there will be worship leaders, successful worship leaders in hell? Well, all I can tell you is that according to Jesus, there absolutely will be. And that's because as Jesus said in Matthew 15 and 7, hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you saying, these people draw near to me with their mouth and they honor me with their lips, but their heart... Their heart is far from me, and in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines, listen, the commandments of men. Teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. That's a biblical way of saying the word legalism. Legalism, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. I want to deviate for just for a minute, make a few comments regarding Legalism. I don't think you can talk about Pharisees without talking a little bit about legalism. Because here's what legalism is. It's adding man's criteria to God's criteria 
and then criticizing and critiquing other Christians around you based on a counterfeit criteria. Adding our rules to God's rules and then seeking to enforce our sometimes and almost always ridiculous rules on everyone around us. That's legalism. Faith in rules rather than faith in Jesus. And I say to you today, it contaminates Christianity. And that's because the author of legalism isn't God. The author of legalism is the devil. In fact, it's one of his most subtle ways of contaminating holy churches and beautiful, perfect gardens because it feels so holy. Legalism feels holy. When you're being a legalist, you feel like you're being righteous and somehow you deserve God's forgiveness and God's love. It makes you feel holy, but I say to you today unapologetically, it's satanic. And from the beginning, that's been one of the devil's most successful tactics at messing up man's relationship with God. In fact, the Bible opens up in Genesis chapter 2 with a perfect man and a perfect woman walking around with their perfect creator in a perfect garden at the perfect temperature of the perfect day. In fact, it was so nice they didn't even have to wear clothes. Or as the Bible puts it, in the cool of the day. And to top it all off, these perfect people are surrounded by free food on every shelf in the entire store except for one. Genesis chapter 2 and 16 says, And the Lord God commanded the man. Listen to God's command. He commanded the man. This is a, a, a big command. Of every tree of the garden you may, underline in your Bible, the word freely eat. That's God's command. Of every tree in the garden you may freely eat. Okay, That's what he says to these two people. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. So God says, kids, look all around you. Think in the beauty of my perfect garden filled with my perfect trees. And I'm commanding you, I'm commanding you, that of every single tree in this garden, you may freely eat. In other words, look to the north, south, east, and west, and I'm giving it all to you to experience and enjoy, and I'm giving it all to you for free. In other words, you can shop till you drop for free. The only exception is the tree of knowledge in the middle of my garden. So if there's a thousand trees, God says, I'm commanding you that 999 trees are available for you to eat and to enjoy, and I'm only telling you you can't eat from one tree. That's the one tree that you can't eat from. It's definitely a tree good for food. It's definitely a good-looking specimen. And the Bible says it was pleasant to the eyes. It was a good tree to look at. Definitely a tree that's desirable to make one wise. In other words, there was a lot of good stuff and a lot of bad stuff to be learned at God's knowledge tree. However, God said, I'm posting a no trespassing sign around my knowledge tree. And the reason God does that is because he will always maintain a line of demarcation between him as creator and us as creatures. That's a good lesson for us as parents. Hence, the boundary around his tree. And also, God didn't want them acquiring knowledge independent of him or in competition with him. And he wanted them to fill their holy, innocent minds with knowledge from him and under him and in cooperation with him. And so God placed the perfect man and the perfect woman in the perfect garden surrounded by incredible freedom and food. But chapter 3 in Genesis introduces us to a serpent that the Bible says is more cunning than any beast that the Lord God had made. And he makes his first recorded statement in the Bible in the form of a question. And in the second and third verses, the woman's response proves that the serpent was successful, listen, at minimizing the incredibly generous provision of God and maximizing the remarkably minimal prohibition of God. And now God's generosity looked non-existent and his rules and his restrictions, his one rule and his one restriction looked ever-present. As Eve said, when she was talking to the serpent, she said that God had said not to eat or Watch this. This is the first time that legalism is introduced to humanity. Eve said that they were not to eat, nor were they to touch that tree that was in the middle of the garden. God had never told them they couldn't touch it. All God said is that they weren't to eat from it. You can read it for yourself in Genesis 2 and 4. And when she did that, she added an additional restriction. Look what the devil got her to do. He deceived her, and now in this garden where she's surrounded by free food, 999 trees that she can eat from, and one she can't, 
God's one prohibition, they began to see God as mean and restricting because legalism is deception and it distorts our view of our totally benevolent Father. Legalism presents God as a cold lawgiver with an insatiable desire to impose an endless list of rules and regulations that are unattainable rather than a loving Father with a driving passion for an eternal relationship. And I say this today, that rules without relationship will always produce rebellion. That's the rotten fruit of legalism. If you have rules for your children without relationship for your children, mark my words, you're going to have rebellious kids. And so don't impose the rules if you don't have the relationship. Start at the foundation of a relationship with your children. And the Pharisees, they, they loved legalism. In fact, it was their passion and it was their life's purpose. The problem is, the rules were always for someone else. And that's why in Luke chapter 11, Jesus said, And you experts in the law, woe to you, because you load people down with burdens they can hardly carry. And then he says this, And you yourselves will not lift one finger to help them. Jesus is the one who originated that saying that we all said to our kids. They would not lift one finger to help these people that they burdened. Because whether it's 26 A.D. or 2024 A.D., the Pharisee M.O. remains the same. Because it's burdens for thee, but breaks for me. I like how A.W. Tozer said it. A Pharisee is hard on others and easy on himself. But a spiritual man is easy on others and hard on himself. Because Pharisees make everyone around them tired from from carrying these burdens and these rules and these regulations that are too heavy to carry. While they sit well rested on their seat of self-righteousness, casting judgment on everyone and everything around them. And I say to you today, it's stinky. And it's obnoxious and it's burdensome and it's the opposite of the heart of God. I say to you today, as we begin to close... Think about your own heart for a moment. When someone is found in sin and you find out about it, or someone has a struggle and you find out about it, what what are the first words that come out of your mouth? What are the first thoughts that come to your mind? Because that is a revelation of your heart. Are you a Pharisee? Someone who doesn't have mercy for those who are struggling around you. Because Jesus is the one who tells every weary traveler who passes by his house, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I ask if anyone here today wants to find rest for your burdened soul. Anyone who's struggling with the sin, Jesus says, come unto me and I'll give you rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. As Jesus surveyed this situation, what the gentle shepherd saw was a very different picture than what these harsh taskmasters saw. Because the Pharisees were all concerned with the consequences for her sin. Jesus, the law says that that you are supposed to stone her, kill her. What do you say we should do? What should, what, should, what should we do about this? We're all concerned about the consequences of her sin. But Jesus, the Savior, was much more concerned about the condition of her soul. And so sometimes when a new convert shows up, Christian folks are more concerned with the length of their skirt than they are the longing of their soul. But Jesus saw the latter. He saw an adulterous kneeling before him who needed atonement. And Jesus was able to look with x-ray vision into her heart and he saw a sinner who was kneeling there longing for a Savior. The Pharisees saw a guilty adulteress, but Jesus saw a needy lady who was looking for something that she couldn't find, looking to fill a void with pleasure and looking in all the wrong places. Because these Pharisees, they were theological thugs intent on teaching and enforcing the law of legalism. 
But all thanks be to God that Jesus was the Savior of the world and he was intent on showing and applying the law of love and of forgiveness. And as I think about this immoral woman, right now as I envision her in the temple, smack dab in the middle of this religious crowd, I want you to envision that scene with me, if you will. Envision her with her hair assuredly probably messed up. Envision her before Jesus Christ with her red face from embarrassment and and shame as all these people at church are looking at her having just been caught in the act of adultery. Envision the tear-stained cheeks and her, her downcast eyes as she's standing before Jesus filled with shame and regret and remorse. Being accused and being confronted mercilessly with her sin. She had nowhere to go and nowhere to hide. And she's thrown down in front of the most holy, righteous, perfect man who's ever walked on planet Earth. That's her condition. As I envision her there being covered by possibly nothing more than just a blanket because she was caught in the very act. As I envision her there before Jesus in that condition, as I was preparing this message and envisioning that, I now envision myself standing before Jesus the judge the one who sees everything and knows everything and there's nothing hidden from him I envision myself standing or kneeling before him recognizing that I too need a savior and I too need someone who's able to forgive everything and I want each of you to envision yourself there standing or kneeling in her place before Jesus the Christ as I envision all that My mind goes to these timeless words. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Save me from its guilt and from its power. Lord, not the labor of my hands can fulfill thy law's demands. Could my zeal no respite know? Could my tears forever flow? All could never sin erase. Thou must save and save by your grace. Father, nothing in my hands I bring. Simply to thy cross I cling. Naked come to thee for dress. Helpless look to thee for grace. Foul I to the fountain fly. Wash me, Savior or I die. And while I draw this fleeting breath, when my eyes shall close in death, when I soar to worlds unknown, see thee on thy judgment throne, rock of ages cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let's bow our heads in the presence of the Lord today. Merciful Father, we come before you broken in your presence. At times we are lifted up in self-righteousness and pride. Looking at the things that we have done. But Lord, when we just get a glimpse of you and your glory, we are reduced to nothing. We are nothing before you. When we think for a moment of the things that we have done, when we think of our worst sins, we're reduced in your presence in shame and in guilt. Recognizing we're not worthy to look upon you. We're not worthy to talk to you. We're not worthy that you would even pay notice of us. For we are sinners. We are guilty. We are needy. We are desperate. But Lord, we say you're the rock of ages. You're the cleft for us. We can hide ourselves in you. You are not a Pharisee. You are a merciful Savior. And you came to this earth seeking and saving that which was lost and That included us. And we're reduced in your presence by your mercy and by your grace. That you did not condemn us according to our works, but you saved us and you redeemed us because of your infinite mercy. Lord, how can it be? How can it be that you, the creator of everything that is, came to this earth and you lived as a man among us and you allowed us to kill you, to hang you on a tree? Then you arose on the third day in resurrection life and with healing in your wings. 
We ponder that even in this moment, Father, that you sent your only begotten Son to save us. Humble our hearts, O oh Lord, I ask. If there's anyone in this room who is not truly born again from above, I ask that right now you would confront them with their sin. Don't let them walk out of these doors without recognizing that they're not truly born from above. Confront each person, I ask, O oh Lord, with our sin. From the oldest to the youngest, don't let us assume. Let us be confronted by your Holy Spirit and give us the grace to respond to the drawing of your Spirit. We thank you for your forgiveness. We thank you for your love. We thank you that you're not ashamed to call us your sons and your daughters. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would draw us, that you would change us. And all God's people said, Amen.